In the spring of 2021, the Poco Muse unveiled a new gallery with an art exhibition appropriately called On the Scene, which presented selections from the museum's permanent art collection, some of which had never been displayed before. At the announcement of the Montague Urschel Gallery, Joanne Urschel, the chair of the Board of Trustees, stated, the arts connect us to our past and give direction to our future. Since On the Scene and Joanne's insightful comment, the Poco Muse has grown its art collection, collaborated with major art institutions, elevated its storage facilities, and established an endowment dedicated to its preservation. Its Robert Kane Gallery, named after a beloved art teacher and local historian, continuously displays artwork created by local artists. Known since 1916 as primarily a history museum, the Poco Muse is now viewed as a favored destination for many generous art collectors who seek a permanent home for their Porter County art. The museum, as its staff and board like to say, sits at the intersection of art and history. Just what exactly does that mean? How do the arts connect us to our past and give direction to our future? This short video slideshow will attempt to answer these questions by presenting highlights from our permanent art collection and discussing a few themes one can find in these works. Let's first take a closer look at a work that actually depicts an important local intersection. Vin Hanel's Courthouse from 1935. Perhaps no other work in the collection better demonstrates the way art can connect us to our history. Upon looking at the painting, we find ourselves standing in the middle of Indiana Avenue, just west of Washington Street in the heart of a bustling Valparaiso. A horse-drawn delivery carriage barrels down the street where a hand-painted sign directs it towards parking. The two white horses wear blinders to prevent alarming distractions. The driver of the carriage waves a mittened hand to two figures leaning against a brick building on the corner. They casually return his greeting. Behind them, a young mother pushes her bonnet-clad baby in a pram. Together, the three men's gestures draw our eye upward along the central streetlight toward the majestic tower of the Porter County Courthouse. It's probably early winter. The bare trees show only a hint of foliage against the gray sky. All but one of the convertible tops on the 1930s era sedans have been pulled up. The orange underpainting can be seen throughout, imbuing the picture with a warm glow, as if viewing the scene through rose-colored glasses. All of these details, carefully considered by the artist, accumulate to portray a small town in the middle of transition. It is speculated that this 1935 painting was commissioned in anticipation of Porter County's centennial celebration the following year. Less than a year prior, on December 27, 1934, a fire damaged the courthouse and destroyed its bell tower, making this a cherished memorial to a beloved building that has been forever altered. The painting reminds us that one season falls away to make way for another. An older horse and buggy generation tips its hat to its successor as it retires out of view. Quietly, an entirely new era is ushered in. Artists are uniquely equipped to interpret this area's history. By introducing new ways of seeing the landscapes that captivate this area's collective attention, the artists in this video slideshow contribute to our historical record and shape our shared memory and imagination. 
By extension, they invite us, the viewers, into new creative experiences and offer us the tools to better understand our world. The Indiana Dunes and the rich landscapes of this region have long invited artists to express their passion for the natural world. Inspired by nature and concepts like stewardship, sustainability, and community, many have found their voice here and in so doing, have attracted the attention of communities far removed from their own. For others, this region provided a means of escape and renewal from a seemingly more complicated urban existence. Yet at the same time, this region's complex identity, where nature, industry, agriculture, science, and art intermingle, has been a source of meaning for many artists experiencing these challenging tensions. The result has been an inspiring artistic legacy unique to this place. Perhaps no other artist is more associated with the Indiana Dunes than Frank Dudley. Described by art historian William Gertz as one of the finest painters working in the Midwest in the first decades of the 20th century, Dudley dedicated much of his prolific professional painting life to the Dunes preservation. Thanks in large part to the efforts of passionate conservationists like Dudley, the Indiana Dunes State Park was established in 1926, and a national lakeshore was created in 1966, later to be upgraded to national park status in 2019. Understandably, many people are drawn in by the beauty of Dudley's paintings. Dudley lived and loved the landscape to a point of obsession, and he captured each scene as a direct, immediate, and sensual experience. His entire body of work shows great stylistic consistency, marked by its photographic realism and its economy of confident brushwork. However, Dudley consciously avoided letting his own flourishes and personality interfere with his subject. He had a larger goal in mind, which Wendy Greenhouse describes as portraying the dunes as the product of various natural processes operating over time, not only by the quickly moving shadows, but also by the subtle contest for dominance between the sand and vegetation. The two Dudley paintings in the Poco Muse collection similarly demonstrate this geological progression. In both, one sees no trace of Lake Michigan. For many Midwest painters, the contrast created where sand met water made the Indiana Dunes an interesting subject. Yet Dudley focuses on a different drama. A blue sky occupies the top third of each picture, while a rich interplay between sand and vegetation unfolds in the bottom two-thirds. Magic of Autumn captures a moment when a scrubby lower dune falls into shadow. One feels a sudden chill when looking out at the bare and sun-drenched dune in the distance. In the second, Dudley lays out the drama in sharper focus. Several twigs in the foreground dune bend to the right while the cool violet shadows of the dune grass in the middle ground extend to the left. The ochre and lemon colored vegetation marches left towards the crest of the sand dune, while at the same time, the sand slowly creeps right to engulf the grasses. A trio of silent conifers keep watch as the battle unfolds. According to Greenhouse, quote, in Dudley's day, the dunes area was visibly recovering from the logging that had virtually cleared its native old growth forests in the mid 19th century, end quote. Dudley's paintings on the margins of sand dunes celebrate the cyclical drama and the vitality of these natural forces.
Marion M. Mudge owned and operated a photography studio in Valparaiso from 1886 to 1937, where he specialized in portraiture and published real photo postcards. The Indiana Dunes inspired his personal interest in landscape photography and his fascination with painting later in life. Both Over the Sand Hills and Haystack Dunes demonstrate Mudge's experimental approach to image making. Having printed a black and white photograph of the dunes onto light sensitive emulsion paper, Mudge then applied opaque oil pastels directly onto the surface of the image. These small works might more accurately be described as hand colorized photographs. Frank Misleave worked in the Mill Gymnasium at Inland Steel in East Chicago and spent his spare time painting the machinery and his fellow mill workers. Later in life, Misleave became passionate about conservation and shifted his focus to the natural landscape of the Indiana Lakeshore. Misleave once remarked, I paint the dunes as I see them, but I paint them too as I remember them in the 20s and 30s. Taken along the crisscrossing trails of the Indiana dunes, the color photographs of Herb Barghusen depict a familiar landscape well known to many visitors of the National Park. Yet for Barghusen, this area and its remarkable history exerted a powerful force on his imagination, transforming into a spiritual forest where illusions slid in and out of view and fantastical creatures suddenly took shape. Occasionally kaleidoscopic and abstract, Barghusen's photographs are often paired with short poems by the poet Robert Longoni, who shared a fascination with the dunes landscape. The story of Porter County artists and the Indiana Dunes could not be told without including Hazel Hinnell and her husband Vin, whose work we explored earlier. Trained at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Hazel worked in many different media in her long art career, painting, printmaking, and pottery. Early on, she designed wallpapers and fabrics for Marshall Fields and the interior of the Victor Vienna Cafe at the Century of Progress Exposition in 1933. During the Great Depression, she and Vin moved from Chicago to Furnaceville, near Chesterton, where they built a home and studio. Hazel fell in love with the flora of the Indiana Dunes and was active in environmental preservation. For many years, Hazel operated a kiln from their studio and was integral in nurturing a vibrant group of Furnaceville artists. In 1988, she moved to Ashland, Oregon to live and work with her friend Harriet Rex Smith for the rest of her life. She died in 2002 at the age of 106 and was working until the end. Outside of the artist communities of the dunes, a strong creative spirit persists. Many community members with full-time careers in other areas have found a second calling tending to their creative impulse. It's not uncommon in this area to discover someone quietly sustaining a successful private art practice. The memory of the place one calls home is often a compelling subject for this creative expression. Some have explored notable landmarks and buildings from their childhood with imaginative and technical success. Others have moved elsewhere, yet still feel the nostalgic pull towards home. The landscapes of home in one's memory can be as clear and real as those set out tangibly before one's eyes. Avery B. Weaver earned the nickname Mr. Vidette Messenger during his tenure as editor of the newspaper between 1939 and 1965. In his spare time, Weaver painted for the love of it, 
and he embraced the amateur designation of Sunday Painter. This painting is a fine example of his use of impasto, a technique where paint is thickly applied to the surface with a loaded brush or palette knife. Born in Chicago, Virginia Phillips studied at the Art Institute of Chicago before joining Mark T. Nielsen as an interior designer in 1953. She followed the firm to Valparaiso in 1960, where she lived and worked for the rest of her life. While in Valparaiso, she took a workshop with Harriet Rex Smith at the Art Barn, which ignited her love of painting that was sustained by the encouragement of German expressionist Conrad Eustel. This scene of a wooded picnic area is reminiscent of the area she knew well, near the Art Barn in Valparaiso. A colorful winter scene includes a note on the back, succinctly outlining Philip's characteristic style. This meets all the criteria I set for myself. Abstract, color bigger than life, strong brushstrokes showing lots of energy. Regional artists often memorialized important local landmarks in their work and brought their own unique perspective to what it was like to live here. Betty Lou Shotliff's 1972 watercolor of Gardner School marked an important moment in the building's history. Built in 1899, the grand building featured four cylindrical turrets, still visible today, and a central tower and spire. The school closed in 1972, prompting much public debate about plans for its use one involving renovation as an art center. In response, artists gathered on the lawn in July 1972 to render the building in different media. It was during this time that Shotliff created this work. Until recently, the building housed the Boys and Girls Club. Currently, it is undergoing development as the Grand Gardner Hotel a 58-room hotel with restaurant and banquet center. Shotliff was a dear friend of Harriet Rex Smith, who lived in Valparaiso until 1978, according to Smith's artist website, when they both moved to Ashland, Oregon, and established studios there. A decade later, Hazel Hanel would join them. This 1976 watercolor of the former Porter County Sheriff's residence marks an important moment of transition for both its creator and the Poco Muse. Just a year prior, the museum opened its doors as the old jail museum in the former Porter County Jail, which can be seen in the background of the painting. This was one of Smith's final Porter County works and was perhaps created in celebration of the nation's bicentennial. Harriet Rex Smith was a pillar of Porter County's art communities. A founding member of the Chesterton Arts Association, she inspired many as a teacher at Valparaiso University, other area schools, and in her workshops at the Art Barn. In her artwork, Smith rarely repeated herself and was never tied down to one particular style. She experimented throughout her life, employing non-traditional approaches to mark making and surface texture. In this watercolor, she appears to have moved the wet paint across the paper by blowing through a straw and by applying salt crystals to chemically displace the pigments. Another local artist who inspired generations of young people was Robert Kane a beloved art teacher at Valparaiso High School. He is best remembered for his pen and ink drawings and his mixed media sculptures of solitary figures and animals. Kane's family in Porter County dates back to 1833. He was a fantastic storyteller and local historian with an astonishing photographic memory. An avid walker, he seemed to know everybody in his community. In his artwork, Kane took inspiration from everything and was passionate about all forms of art, 
whether it was pen and ink drawings, sculpture, or pastels. According to his family, he drew every single day and was known to suddenly pull his car over to make a drawing of something that piqued his interest. His artistic focus was rarely on the present or future. Many of his pieces represent the past, events from his life he never forgot, or moments reflecting simpler times. This solitary figure of a cowboy was one of many cane sculptures made from copper, wood, and other odds and ends found in his home or local junkyards and covered in acrylic and wax. Cain never considered these works finished and often continued working on them for many years. Many of his elongated figures, whether birds or cowboys, wear tired, sorrowful expressions as they look off into the distance. People use art to mark significant occasions. Poetry is read at weddings and funerals. Music announces another anniversary or heralds the arrival of ships and queens. Art celebrates. It documents. It takes a certain artistic diligence to chart an ecological progression or draft an accurate building elevation. Here in our region, artists have been called upon to memorialize the successes of individual careers and cooperative business efforts. They've come from other states to celebrate a farm's award-winning livestock, recording a prosperous legacy. This charcoal drawing of Theodore Spencer Bull's farm and apiary was created by Noah Wesley Wineland from Centerburg, Ohio. Wineland was one of many itinerant Midwestern folk artists at the end of the 19th century to approach prosperous farmers and offer to sketch their home, farm, and animals to commemorate their success. T.S. Bull held a wide reputation as a beekeeper, contributing articles to the still active American Bee Journal. As seen in this drawing, his farm was admired by visitors as remarkably well kept. Bull took pride in exhibiting his hives and demonstrating his methods. Edna Agar was a prominent Valparaiso artist. During her busy life, she traveled as part of the performance trio, The Seminary Girls, taught drama at Valparaiso University, and displayed her artwork in numerous galleries. Harriet Rex Smith remembered Agar's art fondly for its storytelling. There is speculation that Agar worked with Walt Disney Studios when she lived in Los Angeles between 1934 and 1937, dates coinciding with the production timeline of Disney's first full-length feature, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Much of the Poco Muse collection of Agar's work measures no larger than a 3 by 5 inch index card. Many depict the same middle-aged woman undertaking some domestic task. With her graying brown hair tied into a bun, she sweeps dust under a rug or sucks on her finger after burning it on the clothes iron. In other scenes, the subject gleefully stirs a bowl of batter or pours herself a cup of tea at a small table set for one. In their depictions of a singular subject in the midst of everyday life, the watercolors evoke the Dutch genre paintings of the late Renaissance. The style and content of the works is whimsical, gently poking fun at its subject while cherishing these moments as meaningful routine exercises. Agar painted these watercolors as small gifts for her friends, who all understood the character depicted in each of these scenes to be Edna herself. In addition to being an art lover and collector, Philip Brockington was also a practitioner in his own right. 
He was known to paint quick watercolor portraits of friends during a conversation and experimented with Joseph Cornell inspired collages and assemblage. The two mixed media collages seen here, one with a handmade shadow box, were birthday gifts for his parents. Though sometimes overlooked, art that serves an integral purpose in daily life is invaluable to our understanding of the past. For the Poco Muse, this extends beyond the studio easel and to our collection of material culture. During a visit at the Poco Muse, one might see ordinary objects displayed in our art gallery and artwork accompanying a history-focused exhibit. The Poco Muse believes that objects tell important stories, revealing the way of life of people who are often underrepresented or missing from the historical record. Older photographs are typically quite small and rich in detail. They are made and not simply taken. Their creators formally composed the image and physically created the object. Postcards capture ephemeral moments in time. Their beautiful images transport us to a distant past and reading them is akin to reading a message in a bottle. Cherished childhood heirlooms teach us about care and responsibility, even generations later. Much of our collection involves objects and souvenirs brought home from faraway places, as if to say, I was here, this mattered to me, please take care to remember. At the Poco Muse, the boundaries between what is considered art and not are occasionally hard to define. Sometimes standing at the corner of an intersection is the best vantage point for new ways of seeing.